Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the inauguration of Med Talks Bud Club. Off the shelf uh, is the name given to it. Actually, um, I guess, as Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Act two, scene two, Romeo and Juliet. Um, so perhaps the name doesn't mean too much, but that's the name that we've decided on for this book club. Uh, my name's Fahim Shakur, along with my friends Mehran Javed and Zubair Patel. We hope to have this book club every month on the last Sunday of each month. So I welcome everyone who's watching on YouTube Live or Facebook Live. As I said before, it's a monthly book club starting at 8 p.m. Forgive our tardiness. We're just a few minutes late today. And the books will be chosen by the three of us on a rotation policy. And this is recorded and available live as well. As per custom with all book clubs, there are some rules. So I will go through that as this is uh, today's the first session. The first thing is to avoid interruptions, uh, whoever is speaking. Today, it seems to be the three of us. So that should be easily done. Um, drinking is fine, but we're going to avoid any food during the actual book club. And we will always make sure that this book club will be free entry for anyone who wishes to be indulged and educate themselves or learn more about books. And punctuality is important out of due respectfulness to the modus operandi of a book club. And we will avoid any flaming. And this is a form of disagreements that are done in book clubs, which can happen um, and can cause consternation. So that's a, a lot of preamble. Uh, but today's book is The Checklist Manifesto, How to Get Things Right by Atul Gawande, best-selling author of Complications and Better, and obviously being mortal as well. He does have at least four books to his name. A summary from myself, we'll start proceedings, then we'll have a take on the book by Zubair and then Mehran, and then we'll endeavour to have a discussion, and we will be all finished up by 9pm, I guarantee you that, hopefully. So, this book is about one surgeon's experiences of using a checklist and encompassing examples from other professions, including the aviation industry, construction industry, as well as the world of business and other arenas. I thought this book would be a good example for inaugurating the book club, as the back of the book mentions what would be a good and actually good book for this pandemic because it's good for flu epidemics to avalanches if you read the back of the book which i have here for anyone watching mentions it on the back so as i was going past my bookshelf i saw that and thought well this seems like a good candidate for everyone it's for people who may be part of the healthcare professions but also those who are not as well Hopefully those of you listening and watching will take some things away that you can apply in your daily life as we are all settled in the midst of this pandemic. And even those of you will maybe mull over some other things that we go on and decide to. I think it's quite a lot of interesting points. In terms of what I said, I was interested in how we can apply the book to what's going on now. And it talks about checklists, as the name suggests. And that's relevant not only from donning and doffing PPE, but also the mundane issues of having shopping lists. So as we try and keep to our time limited in shopping supermarkets, not touching an item unless we wish to purchase it, the simple public health messages that are going out at this point in time. For instance, washing our hands for 20 seconds at least. When you come home, wash your hands and all of these sort of things. In a way, you might call them templates, checklists, and other things, but they're all relevant and they're all part of the same discussion. So although there may not be a technical checklist, so to speak, the public health mantra of simple messages to enter the nation's conscience and help us all together to fight this pandemic and maintaining social distancing rules, they are in a way a form of a checklist. The book chronicles many different anecdotes, and we'll come on to them later on in the show where the author Atul Gawande, he explains the importance and use of checklists in modern society. In particular, his own work as a surgeon, a well-known surgeon at that, and he explains the WHO surgical checklist, which has been in use for approximately a decade now. The zeitgeist is 2010. And for those of us who remember that time, that was a time when Patient safety initiatives were leaping off the page and the concept of medical errors and enhancing patient outcomes was much more than simply doctors turning up to work and doing their job. 
The book exemplifies the importance of communication and teamwork to articulate why checklists are important in the medical and non-medical sectors. There's also a very intriguing anecdote near the last pages where the surgeon himself be believes the checklist saved a patient on his own theatre table from a near certain death. It's fair to say that there is a happy ending. I don't want to give away too much of the book for those who haven't read it yet, albeit a terrifying ordeal that stayed with him and reinforced the importance of checklists in his mind and also therefore impressed the urgency of getting his message out to a wider audience. To me, it's clear this is one of the reasons with that patient experience as to why he wrote this book. As the reader joins Atul Gwande on his exploration of discovery, this author on numerous interviews that he does across the country and a few across the world during part of his audit of other hospitals. Big institutions are introduced to give merit and rubber stamp the findings that have been produced. The book is well referenced with approximately 181 references detailing the sources for various claims that are made within the book. The simple red cover draws the patient or general reader, whoever is reading it, as often read as a sign of danger in nature as well as general society. The word manifesto lingers in the memory and probably gives more importance to what would otherwise would simply be known as a book of checklists, which are quite commonplace, aren't they, in general? There's also a very good endorsement at the top by a very prominent author, Malcolm Gladwell, on the front cover, which presumably would lead to higher interest in sales and recognition amongst the public domain for people who are aware of Malcolm's work. In addition to this, it's worth noticing and informing the public that I have read this book before. And as I said, I return to it because of the lessons that are in the book that are relevant to all of us in the current pandemic. And as it's by a well-known author, that would be a good starting point for the starting journey of a book club. I've talked a lot about some of the summary, some of the points, why I've brought it in. But no book club or introduction of a book would be complete without talking about the author. So a few words about Atul Gawande. Atul Gawande is someone that I've been familiar with in terms of his work for about a decade now, having read his articles in the New Yorker magazine, sometimes in the New York Times as well, and his other book, Being Mortal, I think was published in about 2014, talking about death and how society looks at that. I have also unsuccessfully tried to meet him once at a medical conference in Edinburgh, I remember, uh, more than five years ago, but that's by the by. I've watched his climb during the medical fraternity, including his expertise in public health, and his actual background is that of a general surgeon with particular interest in endocrinology and endocrine cancers at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, along with being a writer and a public health researcher. In 2018, according to Wikipedia, he also set up a new company uh, CEO, which combined Berkshire Hathaway, which will be known to people in finance and investments, as it's the company of Warren Buffet, along with uh, Amazon cooperatives as well. In summary, this book, if you haven't come across it well, is actually very well known amongst medical circles and also non-medical circles. And the author has a gift for explaining complex concepts in a simple fashion without using too much jargon. I think that really is its hallmark. The general artistry of a good writer is shown that way. He uses short sentences, very few words that are not well known to the audience I use. So really, you can actually read this in one sitting in just three to four hours. He also uses the anecdotes, as we said, to try and delineate his points to make it seem to impress upon the people the importance of a checklist. And really, if by the end of the book, you don't believe in the importance of checklists. I don't think the author succeeded in trying to convey the book to you by then. I don't want to speak much further apart from settling a few ideas to everyone who's listening and watching. And along the way, he talks about a touching memory. When he was a school child, he talks about a, a bookshelf that he tries to make when he's about 10 years of age and how that fell apart as he'd not braced using it, but with a wall. It was a simple anecdote, but quite memorable. During the actual book, he explains conversations that he's had with people at WHO, the World Health Organization, and how they invited him to be part of the task force helping with patient safety. He already had a national and international profile in this domain prior to being uh, headhunted. He mentions at first how he wasn't wanting to take the position, but was convinced by the woman at the end of the phone line. And in a way, that was a turning point in his life. 
As following the work on the WHO surgical checklist, he's now a worldwide name in patient safety. And I guess one of the learning points is don't waste opportunities when they present themselves to you, even though you may not see the clear benefit and be prescient enough to see how it will affect the future. Carp DM. Throughout the book, as we navigate the different stories which are told in clear and precise fashion, and there are many names of ubiquitous large American companies which litter the prose along with numerous examples from the aviation industry, and near the end, the famous miracle on the Hudson, who can forget that, that was done by Sullenberger, which happened approximately a decade ago. In some ways, coincidence or fate lended itself quite neatly in that it happened just approximately a year before this book was published, so he was able to include it at the end chapter. In conclusion, sometimes the benefit or reach of a book is whether you go back to it and read it on more than one occasion, similar to a good film, I guess, or any other artistic piece of work. By that token and by that barometer, this is a classic book, which although may have its criticisms, fair I hope, which we will delve into during the evening, has stood the test of time of at least a decade of advancements in medical engineering and technology which have been on the buy side and perhaps would surpass something as simple as a checklist. A couple of examples where it can be used in modern living I've already mentioned before. But I thought about it longer and I thought, well, where else is it used? Checklist. The motoring industry. What is an MOT? But if not a very good, precise and safe checklist consisting of more than dozens of checks that are done in 45 minutes to an hour to ensure your car is roadworthy. I bring in motoring because the book talks a lot about aviation and maybe aviation is more well-known, grandiose, or perhaps even remarkable in the skies, but the car and motoring is perhaps more mundane and more commonplace. In a way, the checklist as they are, are there to try and help us to prevent serious errors or omissions. And as medical technology and medical advancements and medicine gets more complicated, I guess that's where he saw the niche for this book. In medicine itself, for those who are doctors or practicing healthcare professionals, the concept of having a clear history, examination, investigation, differential diagnosis, and clear documentation are all parts of modern medical practice. And if you think about it, they are a checklist of one sort or another. The use of proformers in medical practice and templates, whether electronic or drop-down templates or paper versions for writing down medical histories is now a part and parcel of life. And in a way, they do act as aid memoirs for parts to be filled in properly. The omissions are conspicuous by their absence. The book also keeps the reader interested by showing the natural curiosity of the author to perhaps go further than how many of us would. How many of us would actually take the next step of emailing or phoning someone once we read an article to find out more and have that conversation and perhaps travel halfway across the country in order to know more about their situation and what they can add to it. Perhaps some of it is investigative journalism by making that step further. I don't wanna give a much more away about the book because we've got the whole evening to discuss, but hopefully that sets the scene and is a good foundation for what needs to be said further. Without further ado, I now bring on Zubair. Thank you, Fahim. That was uh, really um, <laughs> interesting to see hear your thoughts because it was like an actual book review. So I'm really glad that you brought that forward and it shows you've done a lot of work behind what you've done today. It was certainly Actually, more than five minutes for him. <laughs> but, yeah, well, he's a, he's a larger than life character, isn't he? He is, he is. Having said that, I'm actually glad that you brought this book to my attention and, and maybe my hands the same too, because although you've talked about Atul for quite many years, almost as though I felt like he was your brother, uh, and you've read his work a lot, and you, you do talk about him a fair amount. I've never actually picked up his book. Uh, and so having this session really let me um, explore his reading um, and, and have that conversation with him through his written words. So I'm glad you actually brought that to my attention. And the only reason being, one of the major ones for me was, I'd always had a bit of a natural cynicism towards uh, checklists uh, and areas where people follow things through a particular way of doing things, which are standardized throughout the world, purely because I felt as though it hampers imagination it hampers one's personal intuition uh, and, and it doesn't allow innovation to occur. And I think especially in our field of work, 
although some element of concordance is important, you don't you won't really get advancements unless people think outside the box. Um, so I was a bit apprehensive, but when I read his work, I actually thought I've heard the argument now. I've read the argument, and I feel a bit more comfortable with what he's written. So I'm glad he actually put it to my attention. I think the second reason also was is that it's quite an easy book to read. I think it's fair to say that it's not a medical journal. It is a scientific journal. There is a great deal of jargon, although he's put in some jargon, it's mostly non-medical jargon. Um, and it's scatty, so it's not here everywhere. Um, but there's lots of stories inside. So there's lots of things that you can actually read and reflect on. And some of the lessons he's drawn now, he's actually brought to our attention. But there's also things that maybe he hasn't really brought to our attention that may well be um, relevant to us. Uh, and, and you mentioned the curiosity aspect, and that really came up to me because I think at times we become quite ingrained uh, in, in our own journals because there are so many of them. So there's so many things that you can actually learn about or read about in medicine. So to actually have somebody who's so proficient in their speciality actually venturing out there not only reading, but actually seeking out people who are specialists within their field and actually taking the time to discourse with them and actually exhaust out um, bits to that she can, they can actually bring to, to surgery into medicine was actually quite quite um, inspiring in many ways because it, it's made me think now actually uh, about how I bring that to my own practice. Um, I love the fact that you had a neologism there uh, I think we're going to mention aptitude. Um, it's mm -hmm. not a word as far as I'm concerned, um, unless you guys think otherwise. Um, but I love the way he used that. And again, as a doctor, to actually think and have the confidence to do that shows a great deal about the author himself. I was quite impressed because obviously he's a highly um, valued surgeon in where he practices, but he's a quite proficient writer too. Uh, and, and that's something that I do believe there's something in terms of uh, an unmet need uh, in practice where we do find a lot of us have got experiences. Some are better than others, admittedly, and some have more things to bring to the table. But there's a whole dearth of doctors or, and other people who in other uh, professional walks of lives who will study, will learn from people and will have their knowledge that they've acquired pass with them and never really put to pen to paper and there's a, a, a lot of knowledge that actually passes by uh, humankind so i'm really glad that he's done that and i hope that maybe some of us can also be inspired to do that uh, as we go through our careers too um the last thing i would probably say was um i love the fact that he's used complex scenarios and, and thought, I won't provide a complex solution, but I'll try and find a simple solution. And and many a times we actually, I would personally say that you think there's a complex issue and you're looking for a complex solution, whether it's clinical practice or in other walks of our lives. But actually for him to say, you don't need to actually always think about a complicated thing. It could just be something rather simple. And I think that's quite inspiring because I think whether it's per personally or professionally, I suspect we'll all come across issues or incidences within our professional personal life, which we do feel are rather complicated, but actually going back to basics is maybe something we need to consider. Um, you mentioned the, the book and the color, because when I first saw it, I must confess, I thought, does he have socialist leanings? Um, <laughs> I thought it's rather red, manifesto. We've heard of another manifesto a century or so ago, uh, which was probably a lot more radical than, than this is, but his ideas are radical, uh, I, I would argue. He, to tell people who have studied for eons, who have practiced to a high degree of professionalism, who have a high moral code, who have a high ethical code, and to say to them, actually, it's not enough. And you need to ask somebody who maybe hasn't done as much training, who hasn't done as much studying, who maybe historically weren't valued as much to actually tell you how to practice. And in your own theater, or in your own hospital, I think that's quite a radical idea. Um, so I think kudos to the guy, he's actually done it. People are brought into it. Uh, he's prevented, provided evidence to suggest it works. Uh, and, and, and that's obviously great to hear. But I did like the fact that he chose the color red. I'm glad you, you flagged it up too. Uh, and I guess lastly, I would read it again because I think there's a lot more to be gained from, from doing so. And obviously I know you've read it 
maybe a lot more times than I've had hot meals. Um, but it's good to kind of to know that it is available, and I think it'd be great to read again once more. Thank you. Mehran, can we get your thoughts on the book, please? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. You you both have talked about the appearance, and yeah, I agree that there is almost a uh, a social socialist leaning towards it. Um, the 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 color red, danger, fight or flight, it almost calls someone to action, uh, someone to reflect, someone to take some kind of leadership, someone to be the the center of the decision making. That's kind of how it um, how it transcends that message to me. Um, I came to this book not really knowing what to expect, but I have read one of his previous books, Being Mortal, um, and this is something that actually focused a lot more about uh, the later stages of, uh, of their lives, about uh, acceptance, about failure, uh, and about the importance of values and people. But this, this book, um, and I guess we can talk about the strengths and, uh, and weaknesses later, but uh, as you alluded to, uh, Zubair, it, it does reference the complex, um, but doesn't really delve into it. But the focus appears to be more on simple and complexity and, and what's, uh, what's the best approach. Uh, and I guess I kind of understand that because you can't really go to the complex without being able to do the simple and the complexity issues. Because uh, that means you haven't really laid the foundations, you haven't really understood the values. Um, it's 220 books. Uh, 220 pages. Um, it's, as you said, uh, it can be read relatively quickly. I think it took me a little bit more than four hours to read. Um, <laughs> and certainly, um, I probably will avoid a Kindle version of that book. <laughs> but um, but I thought it was, it was certainly enjoyable. And it's very difficult to say that you haven't really gained something from that book. Um, there were some things that uh, perhaps I wished I had um, uh, picked up earlier. I graduated uh, and um, you know uh, started practicing um, as a doctor from 2007. Uh, it wasn't long after that that the book was actually released. So then there was some key things that actually um, comments on, uh, such as forget the paperwork, focus on the patient. Um, mm-hmm. And we, we understand the value of that. At the same time, he's not saying don't do any paperwork. But the the immediacy, being present, uh, mm-hmm. being involved, and being aware of um, the predictable as well as the unpredictable nature of the situation, I think that's quite key. Um, and then just about uh, the other thing that a doctor has to be prepared for unpredictable outcomes, and preparations mean checklist. So it's just mm-hmm. about rehearsal, uh, just about um, you know having certain behaviors so, so that you're able to adapt to the best of your ability. So certainly there's lots of um, interesting messages, valuable messages, um, and uh, yeah, I did enjoy the book. We'll come to the ratings um, later on, but uh, but certainly I would recommend people uh, picking up this book. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, both of you, for your initial thoughts. We're going to go through in a methodical fashion, almost like a checklist now, I guess, to uh, actually examine the book a bit more forensically. Uh, and we've got some discussion points. So I want to take maybe two at a time in the interest of time. So the first two is going to be what did you like best about this book and what did you like least? Um, so I'll start with that. I thought the best thing that I liked about this book is the applicability of it, the concept of checklist, which I actually use in daily life. Um, For instance, as I gave some examples during the pandemic, knowing which things to take as I leave the door and how we're applying it in terms of actual hand hygiene, social distancing, remembering the public health measures. And as he said, like I said before, he mentions at the back, flu pandemic. He mentions it, that it should be used in a flu pandemic and we're in a coronavirus pandemic. So I think the applicability, the general availability to the masses of this book, if they know about it, which hopefully today will help with, will actually be one of the best things in addition to his writing style. Um, I think the least one, um, what did I like least about the book? I think it's maybe just uh, maybe the the biases that come in. Obviously, there's uh, quite a lot of centering towards uh, large corporations and so on. And his life, the author's life, has gone towards that. I've mentioned his new company from 2018, he's CEO of, with large corporations. And I think there's an inherent bias. The things I didn't like was the big mention of sometimes the big names always, as if uh, 
the purring off the tongue almost with the the from Harvard or the went to Brown University names of Ivy League universities, Walmart's thrown in, Boeing's thrown in, and. I don't know if it was just mainly for name checking or, or what was the rationale for that. And also everyone's described by their occupation, that person who went to this illustrious place or that illustrious place. It's as if almost the, the person who's then reading the book has preformed uh, an opinion of the person he's brought in and their level of excellence almost, as opposed to what they've actually added to the book or what they've done. You know, they've got a $500 million company or this. Uh, and so I think, I don't want to live life always thinking about how good your institution is or how big you are. If you've got a good thing, then you're just good by its merits. Um, so that came across sometimes or like I've been to Boston. For those of you who've been there, you know, that's not where the Harvard professors live, that part of Boston. And, you know, obviously he is a Harvard professor. So, I mean, these sort of things, these nuances which come on, um, it's entertaining, but also I think it can be a bit grating after a while. I got a bit grated by th this concept. So Beth, what did you like best about the book and what did you like, what was the worst? I'll just say one thing about the mentioning of prestigious universities and institutions. In many ways, mm. I think a lot of individuals would rather hear from somebody or want to know about how Boeing was successful and how right. somebody who went to Harvard thinks as opposed to from somebody who went to maybe my, my alumni, Liverpool University <laughs> went to, because we do tend to aspire towards those institutions and we try to gravitate towards those areas. We don't tend to have people thinking, well, actually, how did the local corner shop make it? It's more a case of how did Walmart make it and how did Boy make it? But I do get your point that maybe there's a bit more bias towards the bigger and the more prestigious institutions. Going back to what I love about it, it's a book, so I want stories in my book, I want to be entertained. Uh, it's not a medical journal, like as I mentioned before. Mm. So I do want to read it and think, well, actually, I've I've got some stories here, which you can always plug at some stage and maybe use when you've got students or otherwise, or maybe even with, with family. So that, mm. for me, was a big thing. Um, I love the fact that he felt confident to kind of bring those stories in. The least bit, for me, would be similar to what you're saying, broad brush, simplistic, conclusions to complex examples that he gave. So he, he would say something or give an anecdote and he would glean out the thing that reinforced his position. Um, and I don't think there was much critical analysis in what he said from those examples. Um, obviously it wasn't a, a sort of a peer reviewed journal, uh, which I appreciate, but on many occasions, the solutions the the checklist rather that he alluded towards with every single scenario that he presented with it reinforced his bias and he never given any examples where maybe a checklist didn't quite work out or didn't quite provide yeah. a satisfactory solution because for every time it goes wrong uh, sorry it goes right rather for the child in austria or a hurricane in the states there are times where checklists are used and it goes wrong and i think it would have been in the interest of balance and for also for my own personal understanding it would have been good to know actually where it went wrong by using a checklist and maybe where innovation or thinking with using instinct would have worked better so that was my sort of criticism there Meran? yeah so um the positive nature or the certainly the the good qualities of this book is uh, perhaps we've alluded to is the accessibility and the general nature uh, of how information is delivered so you you don't need any specific qualifications you can just pick it up it's very visceral you can learn um, something by you know just going through the book so it's it's in terms of uh, grammar uh, and degree of knowledge um, you know the uh, degree of words and the um, the hierarchy and the quality of those things. I think it's quite simple. It's quite straightforward. So I think that I quite appreciated that element. Um, the again, the complex element or the avoidance of it. Um, I thought that was the negative thing. He'd used the example of Brenda Zimmerman and Shalom Gloman, um, and they were they're quite prominent when it came to the Canada Health Act uh, because they uh, they needed to actually uh, review the situation a little bit like how NHS kind of reviews the state of play and realizes we need to do something more. So the five four five year forward view, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think they they talked a lot about how to actually approach. Uh, complex issues. So things such as emotional 
um, <clears throat> emotional tensions, knowledge tensions, whether we're thinking about professional versus lay, evidence versus experience, um, uh, economic tensions, whether it's public versus private, as well as governance tensions, whether it's comp competition versus collaboration. So there's lots of little um, things to certainly focus on, and I, I probably would have benefited from it, but that's, that's probably coming from a place that I feel... Um, I understand the value of the, of the checklist, the simplicity and the application of it, uh, but it's more about how do I get a more rounded uh, understanding to any kind of scenario that comes. So I think it's um, lack of direction uh, on the complex issues. I think that that's where it fell for me. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the next two discussion points. Uh, again, as I said, we'll take two at a time. So next two is, what are the books, films that this remind you of? How did the book make you feel? What emotions did it evoke? Um, and I noticed these are common questions in book clubs. That's why I picked these questions. In terms of other books, I think the one that came to mind for me was How Doctors Think by Dr. Jerome Grouperman. Uh, that's a good book that I, I read some years ago, uh, and it's a book which explains the thought processes behind the decisions doctors make. Again, it's to do with the whole domain of medical errors, patient safety, but also how we can quickly formulate a decision making um, and not think of all the diagnosis or revisit it if we're not sure and anchoring and all of these sort of concepts. Um, the reason that that came to mind when I read this book is because in a way the checklist is one portion of patient safety initiative, but there's a whole host of things, including you know, behaving civil with your professionals in the workplace, which has now become a movement. Obviously other movements such as the My Name Is movement, uh, that was started by Dr. Kate Granger, unfortunately, who, who died a few years ago, but back in 2013. Again, they're all types of things to not only benefit the patient in terms of comfort, but hopefully a better patient outcome. So I was really thinking of other books by authors um, who actually are trying to work in the field of uh, patient safety. In terms of films, I brought that in. Um, there was one anecdote which made me think of The Green Booker. I don't know if you guys have uh, watched that film with Mahesh Ali. Um, I think it was Oscar nominated uh, maybe a year or two ago. Uh, and uh, it's a biographical comedy drama road film uh, about the jazz pianist Don Shirley. Uh, and the reason you're thinking, what's that got to do with this? Well, there was just one bit which made me reminisce about it when he talks about the, in a uh, checklist about the M&Ms being taken out and only the brown ones um, to be taken out and the rest of the left in. <laughs> and in, in the film, uh, The Green Book, uh, Don Shirley, he ensures that every time he does a concert, they should use a Steinway piano. And sometimes he doesn't do it if it's not provided. Now, there's a different rationale. We're not sure why that's meant to be one of the best pianos, whereas for this reason in the book is uh, for more in terms of fastidiousness and meticulousness. Um, but I like the way that you can actually have things and it. it's not just celebrities being a diva. And so that came out in one of his anecdotes. Over to you, Zabé. Uh, what, how did it make you... Uh, you know, what kind of things that you think in terms of the book film did it remind you of? Well, in, in terms of books and films, I couldn't think of a single reference because obviously I, I got your questions afterwards, but it made me think Danny to actually watch the movie Sully with Tom Hanks. So mm. I will actually have to look at that when I get the time to do so. Um, <laughs> I haven't read many books when it comes to patient safety, admittedly, uh, that are of this genre uh, or of this caliber, really, although I've read more dry things that we get through medical journals. So obviously it's kind of opened up that, that area for me. So I'm glad that you actually brought it to my attention. Um, and hopefully I might have to look into the other books that you mentioned there at some stage. Uh, I guess in terms of emotions, um, it made me feel, I would say quite comfortable with what we're doing. I think sometimes you, you, we do work uh, and you, we do at times want reassurance that actually what we're practicing makes sense and it has been thought through. And to actually hear one of the architects of the checklist um, revolution uh, and the, the sort of working that we do nowadays, and to actually hear from his pen what he went through and why he did so, and the efforts he went through, because he didn't just stay in America and, and kind of get on with this. He traveled the whole world um, from parts in Karachi and, and Amman all the way through to mm -hmm the um europe and america so and then actually looked at what he'd done and he'd spent time going through his issues and the fact that he uses it himself and as a surgeon to use it himself i think for me 
kind of helped to think, oh, okay, that's reassuring. So I felt more comfortable having read his work and felt as though, okay, I don't feel the same level of, oh, why do you have to do this for? So I think it helped with my some of my reticence when it comes to checklists and some of my misgivings when it comes to checklists, having read his work. Mm -hmm. Mehran? So what, what are the books or films that this remind me of? Well, I was hoping they would remind me of a little bit more about being mortal, but the I guess the style and the delivery was just completely opposite. And hmm. I guess that's just note to self uh, about expectations and what to, um, what to, you know, actually pick up from the book. Um, and it does remind me about Dr. House. I'm not sure if you guys have actually seen Hugh Laurie. Um, you know, it's quite a famous um, TV uh, TV show. But the, just the way that they approach the simple, more common things. And it's, it's very much a checklist, um, trying to always adapting um uh, the situation to what, what they're thinking so I, so certainly i couldn't i could relate on, on that platform um but yeah that, it's beyond that i probably wouldn't say it reminded me of a, of a great deal i thought it was um it was as you said the anecdotes the examples were very much um uh you know high caliber um examples that he uses uh, but at the same time he describes the people that he interacts with a very you know people off the street uh, so kind of the descriptive nature I think we can certainly talk about that um, but yeah so th those are the kind of the initial impressions that I have when I start reading the book okay good we'll keep going on swiftly um, so Couple more again in one go. What do you think the author's goal was in writing the book? What ideas were they trying to illustrate? Messages, and any query inaccuracies or things in the the book that you found? Um, so I'll start. In terms of obviously the goal in writing the book, I think I made clear at the beginning is to impress upon the audience the importance of checklists, how they can be used in society, why they're important, how they came into his life, the ideas he's trying to illustrate. I think by bringing in big business and other companies is that. And also the NHS, he references the NHS because one of the hospitals involved in the actual preliminary audit, so to speak, was St. Mary's in London. Um, and I think he does impress upon the audience as well how that works quite well. The benefit of that is I think how they can both work together, private sector to a degree and um, the NHS or public sector as well. Um, messages he's trying to send out is obviously the importance of ingenuity. I think that comes across, obviously, and mm -hmm. taking risk and also staying with entrepreneurs there's a section in the book where he talks about which entrepreneurs get investment and it's not just the ones with the ideas no people can get ideas it's the ones who follow through with the idea and get it done ups and downs go through it all and there's a section on that and i thought what well, was quite interesting i took that away as one of the messages Isabel, over to you yeah i think there was there was much to be said about what he was trying to achieve from writing this book um i think purely the fact that he'd done so much work and although he'd managed to get his work out there in, in I believe the Lancer um, mm. and the NAJM those are niche markets and although people who read broadly may have come across them in other areas of industry for the laity the people that are going through airports every day the individuals that are all that want to buy a book for their loved ones over for special events etc it, it won't really register with them and they, they won't really be too inclined towards the nitty-gritty i would imagine but to have it presented and the arguments he gave were p things that you could actually relate to in other areas if you're an engineer you could relate to it mm. if you were uh, working on a building site you could relate to it so i think that his reason i would imagine for writing the book was to actually bring his ideas to a wider audience he'd obviously convinced the medical fraternity in some in some shape or form of the merits of doing this uh, and you can see that by by its wide implementation but i suspect part of me thought well what about other people that maybe aren't using it so i'm sure there are industries still that maybe don't use checklists yet so they mentioned aviation you talked about your local car mechanic you've talked about other industries that I'm sure there are others that mm. maybe don't use it as well. Mm. Um, having said that, um, the, the, the only thing that I was going to say really with regards to the writing the book was it, it allowed him the opportunity to actually bring in other things. So you mentioned that about the entrepreneurs 
and and maybe there was something that about how he has managed to acquire wisdom over time but he would never again be able to write that down anywhere in a medical journal but by writing a book it gave him the the avenue and the the oxygen to actually do so uh, so i think there's something there for us to reflect on that maybe there are things that as a secondary thing you can bring into a book where there are nuggets of wisdom they can scatter in there from life experience or from speaking to others um so i think that's probably one of his his reasons for doing so Mehran, any um comments yeah so just going back to the question uh about the author's goal and uh, i think it's the uh i agree with both your points i do think it just rein states the importance of natural curiosity um all the uh, kind of anecdotes uh the examples about the the skyscrapers or the uh aviation examples uh these are these are examples that uh, you probably would have had access to or at least you know if you're walking down the streets there there's lots of buildings so it's that natural curiosity of, of thinking okay how do they mitigate errors how how do they approach this so it's um so it certainly invites and encourages people to to delve deeper um and um the the determination the perseverance uh, you know the perseverance uh, that he shows i think these are certainly good qualities um and it just kind of transcends through his writing uh, mm. that even though through uh, through his first example of failure through the uh, first encounter with the world health organization uh, when mm. he tried to implement the checklist he went back to it and he still tried to, you know tried to actually uh make a difference so um so i think certainly it's um, a lot about information about behaviors uh and the importance of natural curiosity i think those those were the key things for me in addition to everything that we've talked about okay uh we're going to rattle through questions uh cuz mm -hmm. we Time is always our enemy. Um, we're going to take a few of them in one go to complete the first PowerPoint slide. So obviously inaccuracies, Americanisms, criticisms, how it might change your practice, a few words on that. So I thought um, I did ask a dentist about this concept of brushing your teeth twice a day, preventing pneumonia. Um, and uh, I also checked his references in the end of the book, and it's very little to no references about that. Now, that's interesting because you have to remember this book was written in 2010 where there was very little evidence to actually support the viewpoint that brushing your teeth twice a day will prevent a pneumonia, perhaps a ventilator associated pneumonia. Since then, it's grown, I'm happy to say, and I can confirm it. But I think at that time it was a bit of a thing. Um, you could say that there was a fallibility in the book in that. And I think sometimes when he strays outside of his area of expertise in medicine, then you can see some of the chinks in the armor in the book, I think, uh, it's fair to say. Americanisms, I bring that in just because there were certain things that for maybe other readers, it's very, it's a book for an American market in many ways, I think, because of the language that's used. Code Blue, which is like a crash call here in the UK, residents, well, you know, attendings. It's almost as if you would know what they meant, but you wouldn't know what they meant if you were practicing in a different part of the world uh, and some of the jargon. Um, criticism, what could have been better? I think maybe just finish it off in that way perhaps a bit more exploration about his insights into the case that nearly went disastrously badly at the end i think um, it's fair to say he mentions a patient who who's basically left blind in one eye uh, for a long period of time i think that's quite devastating um and i think that deserves more than a few pages at the end of a book as almost a footnote um i think because obviously it's changed his uh, practice he, he he never looks at adrenal surgery in the same way again mm -hmm. and he mentions that he's done about 40 operations and i don't know what the number would be to be proficient in it but it seems like a low number of operations to to be call yourself proficient so i think that was maybe just something um and i've seen that in some of the books where the patient safety where they have a disastrous consequence some patient harm and then it's almost as if your redemption comes in the form of a book or uh, of that nature uh, and really i think he's quite lucky in that sense that the, the patient was so forgiving about it that could easily have been completely different if you had an unforgiving patient Zubair, what about your comments on the last points of that PowerPoint? I think I'll say two things there for him, um, because the Americanisms part, I think was reasonable for him to do so, because he's American. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so he would mention American terms. Um, I One criticism I had was, he, just one example, he talked about ICU care mm. and the need for antacid treatment whilst you're an ICU patient. Now he says that the checklist was useful because it, it basically lets people 
sorry, practitioners that are there initiate treatments that they would normally forget. Mm. But his argument, though, is slightly not shaky because he says that 50% weren't actually aware uh, that you actually had to give antacids in ICU. So I just thought maybe there were certain mm. things we thought, hold on a second, I've got something very different to what you've said there. So again, it brings me back to my point about he has used a lot of different anecdotes in different situations, but there are times where I think actually I don't believe the checklist was the true solution. There were other things at play. The checklist may have been supplementary, but it wasn't core. Uh, the second thing was for me, um, I just love the master builder analogy that he had. Um, I've already mentioned it at work once. So, um, but I just love the fact that he he kind of brought that up. And because you, you, we've always seen masterpieces in the past. We've seen. Um, whether it's the Blue Mask or the Notre Dame or whatever else, whether mm. it's in the flesh or pictures. And you, you kind of forget that actually there was one person um, who actually masterminded that. So whether it's Sinan in, in Turkey or, or, uh, or otherwise, but there was one person who actually oversaw it all. And he just said, this is it and that's it. And there's nobody there to question him or query him uh, and say, actually, is that right? Is that right? And there wasn't really a, a, an element of discussion mm -hmm. or, or whatever else. Whereas nowadays, we don't do that. Well, architects don't do that anyway. They they consult with mm -hmm. the electrician, the plumber, I don't know, whoever else is involved in building a, a building nowadays. Whereas we still, I don't know about you, Fane, but in primary care, we're still very much, yeah, come and see me and I'll do everything. Uh, if it's mm -hmm. a, um, no matter which diff issue it is, whether it's a social issue, whether it's a medical issue, whether it's a gynae issue, whether it's a pediatric issue, a psychiatric issue, mm -hmm. whether it's an issue with your uh, neighbor, we will try and address the issue for you. And I think we at times forget that actually we need to think about how we approach um, our practice and think, well, actually, what is it here that I'm doing? And, and what is it that maybe I should ask others to do for me? Uh, because we do do referrals, we have a format for that, and we do have systems in place for that. But I think our complexity has increased in primary care, especially. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did bring this to my team that actually we need to think about this a bit more closely about how we look at how master builders have turned into different and, and they've fragmented themselves into different specialisms. Whereas we are now very much in the mold of master builders. Women master practitioners in, in family practice, if you could call it that. Um, but we haven't really moved with the times. Uh, so there's something about modernizing the way we actually practice because everything around us is modernized. So we have people that come and inspect our work. They use checklists. Mm. We have the people that built our building. They use checklists. The people that create the referral pathways, the IT systems, all of them use checklists. We're the only ones who are quite Luddite really in the way we are still practicing. So I think there is something that about re actually letting this work come to our own practice. I know, I know he wrote the book 10 years ago and we are rather slow on the uptake with radical ideas, but I think there's something about maybe looking at this a bit more seriously and thinking, well, actually, what should we be doing? And what should we be saying? Actually, no, there's somebody who's better at it than I am. Or maybe I actually should, should consult with somebody else mm -hmm. and let them handle it. I think it's it's um, it's good that you brought in the toothbrush thing for him because it's um, <laughs> how you know how do you um, define inaccurate or uh, mm. you know given the false uh, narrative about a certain procedure because now for for example reading through literature you know I'm I'm not a, uh, I don't work in the ICU far from it <laughs> but it's the fact that they actually promote. Um, uh, brush, brushing. If you're on ventilation, there, there is a lot of evidence uh, suggested that it's uh, clinically uh, significant that it's that intervention will lead to reduction in uh, pneumonia cases. Um, so we always have to be mindful of whether sometimes the guidance is evidence-based or experience-based, whether it's data-based or narrative-based, and there al always needs to be some degree of accommodation to both aspects. Because sometimes if we if we pretty much try to um, use statistics uh, and go down the statistical uh, significant route, sometimes even um, little marginal gains will be omitted. So it just you know brought some points home. Um, the criticism, um, the master builder, um, the fact that he. Uh, 
I'm trying to avoid potential prejudices of uh, how some some people see surgeons. Um, I, I I can clearly state that he's not a typical surgeon. Um, you know, given some of the narrative that you sometimes hear, but clearly the master builder being center of the operating theater, um, mm. actually dictating the state of play, uh, being responsible for life and death, uh, slightly grandiose in how he pictures it, but there was, um, there's little appreciation. I guess there was perhaps some appreciation when he goes and, um, does, spend some time with the World Health Organization about there's actually the uh, the, the director, the, uh, the CEO of the hospital making sure that the supplies, the sanitary conditions, the staffing, all those things are in place to allow you to work in the best possible environment. So I, I thought that was the criticism that he perhaps didn't appreciate that to a greater degree. Um, when he was interacting with uh, with people from different um, parts of the world. Okay, good. Um, we've been live for over 50 minutes now, so we're into the last 10 minutes, and then at the end, Zubair will introduce the, the last uh, next month's book. So I want to actually tackle all of the next slide and points <laughs> in one go with us all. So mm -hmm. about two, three minutes each, and I'll go through it all for the audience. It's the learning points, aptitude versus ineptitude, any interesting anecdotes, uh, any focus that we thought, anything out of date, any relevance any checklist, which we've covered a bit before in the star rating. So in terms of the learning points, I think there's so many from the book. If I was just to pick out a few, obviously the importance of being an entrepreneur, using checklists, trying it for yourself. I think that's a good learning point as well. And having that natural curiosity, aptitude versus ineptitude. I think that was just one of the arguments in the book, obviously how mistakes can happen through ignorance or they can happen when you know the actual material, but it's actually still doing it badly. Um, I think we, we did want to talk about some of the grammatical areas in, in a book club. And so this format of the book relies heavily on anecdotes. There's the one in the girl in Austria at the beginning and how they managed to resuscitate and save her life. And obviously how Walmart uh, was a, a helper in Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina and so many other anecdotes, which you two might want to touch on, whichever ones you found useful. Um, obviously, it's quite a hospital based book and that lends itself because that's the specialty of the author itself. So I think uh, primary care uh, and other specialities uh, like palliative medicine, although that's touched upon in one of his other future books, Being Mortal, I think came out in 2014. So for, for those who are wanting a, a primary take, a primary care outlook, I think they just have to extrapolate from this book because it's wholeheartedly based on hospital medicine. I mentioned out of date information just as one of the points we might because obviously it's 10 years later. You know, this as I said at the beginning in the preamble, the zeitgeist is 2010 and the, and the world's moved on now. So, certain statistics that I use, you just have to use with a pinch of salt because they, they've changed. Like, for instance, how much India spends on its healthcare. It's, it mentions double figures, and that's gone up so much higher now. And we're expecting its economy to take over UK by 2040. So, I think the way you look at the what are middle income countries and so on and things has really changed in the last 10 years. Relevance to the pandemic there's so many i mean as i said as i leave the house i use a checklist uh, and obviously donning and doffing pp in particular i think taking off pp there's a certain way you have to do it and to prevent infection hand washing you know and that's obviously become a big issue so many different things of being systematic and methodical and, and like I said, the checklist in everyday life, um, I think for you, uh, Rebecca, you were going to mention CPR. So I won't mention that, but things like writing things down, prescription doses, as I mentioned, templates, drop down tabs, pro formers, mandatory training, they're all in a form, a way of checklists as well. So really, I have been using this book in, in life since I read it, I guess, uh, although more so now. Star ratings always hard, uh, and I do have the benefit of the good reading guide star rating <laughs> based on over 3,000 people, but I made my rating before I saw that in my defense, and I, I'd give it a solid four out of five, and, and I think uh, that's a really good rating, but I think that takes into account the eminent person, he's got TEDx talks from this. There's numerous books when you go on his website, atulgawande.com, and interviews he's done on this. Clearly, it's part of the it's part of the American culture and popular culture now in the medical world. So it's an undeniable uh, giant there now. So for that reason, I had to give it four star. Zubair, you're summing up thoughts? Yeah. Um, aptitude, aptitude against ineptitude. I obviously flagged that up because I thought, what is aptitude? I've never come across that term before. I thought it was an Americanism, first of all, but it wasn't. It seems to be that he's made up with uh, a, a neologism, as they call it, in, in some circles. Um, but I thought it was great of him to do so, um, just having that confidence again to say, well, actually, there isn't a word that exists for this. I'm just going to make one up. 
and and see whether it catches on. I don't think it has caught on, admittedly, um, but it was good at least that he gave it a gave it a twirl. The anecdote that really struck me was the the girl in the lake in Austria um, who sadly became uh, trapped into the lake. Um, obviously, it's quite emotional, and and obviously when you're a, you're a father and and you've got young girls, obviously you feel a bit more it kind of touches a nerve in some way. So it was nice to dawn that I actually did it, had a pleasant ending because I was a bit worried initially when I first read thinking this isn't going to end very well. Uh, but actually knowing that it ended well uh, was really quite reassuring. But I could not quite figure out why he put it in there initially. I just thought, okay, it's a nice story, but why is he written this story down? But obviously it became clear later on why he'd done so because it gave you um, the reasons, as in the checklist that they'd formulated, which was being run by the telephone operators in the, the clinics in Austria. Uh, and the way they made the system work so smoothly for that young girl, and I think for others too. Um, obviously, you mentioned that sadly, prior to the checklist being implemented, there was a higher fatality rate uh, when these things occurred. Um, so it was nice to actually have that anecdote there. And I love the way he kind of mentioned it initially, but then brought it back to our attention later on. So it created a bit of suspense, um, which is at times difficult to do with these sort of pieces of work. Yeah, I mean, the focus quite clearly was on secondary care. and I guess you would say mostly in surgical theatre, but he is a surgeon. Um, a lot of people do sadly pass away in, in surgery, um, despite the best efforts of our, of our surgical colleagues. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, there is a lot of surgery being taking place throughout the world nowadays in a variety of settings with a variety of, of provisions. Um, you mentioned certain hospitals where they would rewash the gloves and you know reuse instruments, which obviously we never do here in the, the, the UK, but obviously others don't have the same uh, liberties, unfortunately. But it was good that he kind of um, mentioned it. Uh, but, but again, he is a surgeon, so he would do so. Um, but it made it a bit more tricky for me because I'm thinking, well, how do I make this relevant to my practice? Uh, so for me, the only thing I could think about really was CPR and, and basic life support because whenever we have our annual training, we get a, a, a sheet and there's stuff in there about adrenaline dosages that you remember for a while, but then kind of, because we don't use it thankfully very often, mm -hmm. it kind of slips their mind. But we have those sheets within our recess bag. We have them ready. So if ever somebody did have an issue within the practice we could use them quite quickly and again his argument about freeing the mind from the mundane to focus on the complex is really quite relevant there because you don't have to remember the actual figure of how much you're to use but you can actually then focus on other things because it's all there for you so i think that was really good for him to mention that um i couldn't really think about many other examples doing primary care for checklists because i don't think we really do them, but I know you've put a few there with regards to drop down tabs on Emis Web and, and that sort of thing and performers that we use. And I guess, yeah, you could say they are checklists. I've just thought them to be more administrative, to be quite honest with you, mm -hmm. as opposed to checklists in nature. And the only other checklist we've got really is for, for patients that we refer, refer for memory clinic where we've got the bloods to do mm -hmm. and the ECGs, et cetera. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think you are right though. I think if we were being a bit more loose with the definition, then I think definitely we use checklists throughout our practice for everything from who's had the core training done and who's had their um, main tr training bits done for, so for example, IT and clinical information governance, etc. cetera. Um, star rating wise, <sighs> definitely, I wouldn't say it was a five. I enjoyed reading it. It was easy to read. It, it was inspiring. It was, there was lots of stuff there that made me read it through and I, it was cumbersome. I've read, I've read other books where it's taken me years to read because it's taken a lot of time to, to kind of go through them. I've learned a lot with the book, but I wouldn't say that with the amount of words and pages he's got there, I think there are other books that maybe you could learn more from, but I would definitely say it was a lot more entertaining than others were. So I would concur with you and go for a four out of five uh, on that basis. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I think it's far better than many of the books that you'll see out there. Mehran, your summary? So the so learning points, I, th I think there's, 
Um, he does mention a lot about values and about the routine. Uh, sometimes because we, we become so routine bound, you can take your, your focus away and something that's when failures start to emerge. So I think he, he talked about the importance of freedom and discipline, craft and protocol, as well as specialized ability and group collaboration. So I think those kind of snippets of uh, uh, commentary I thought was quite valuable. Um, the ineptitude or um, aptitude, maybe more correctly um, used, uh, it certainly um, uh, missed the, you know, uh, the state of ignorance, I guess, if we're probably all from a state of ignorance. Um, and then we kind of build on that. Uh, and then it's dependent on certain um, criteria uh, in terms of how, how you defined um, a degree of intelligence and uh, ability to, to acquire knowledge. So, um, so yeah, so there was a bit of wordplay, um, but I certainly enjoy the anecdotes. Um, I thought the Hurricane Katrina, uh, how the state of play between the state, federal, as well as the private sector, or the, or the lack of it, um, led to individual leadership, uh, especially Walmart's kind of running the show with two uh, two thousand five hundred trailers and uh, you know uh, s sponsoring three and a half million. So I think there's there's certainly snippets uh, snippets of knowledge which I which I quite appreciated. But uh, during that whole uh, fiasco, I guess you can use that word, um, was that there was not really you know uh, there was no one in ivory tower kind of commanding how things need to be done it was more about you're on the ground you're in a dynamic environment make the best choice uh, available to you so i think th those are quite powerful things um in, in terms of checklists i think we all use them as you, you talked about referral to men memory clinics a bit yes uh, unfortunately we we have to have those checklists um we would appreciate more than three lines on a history but you know that's for another day <laughs> But um, but I thought it, it was a good book. I enjoyed it. I think it's very difficult for me to give a four out of five for a book that I thought was good. So I'm going to give a three out of five um, just because it probably left me, uh, maybe that's the purpose of the book, but it left me more questions than I uh, had answers. So certainly if you're thinking about this book, it's not a how to do a checklist. It's certainly about the importance of checklists. Excellent. Our hour is up. I'm glad. Uh, I feel vindicated that uh, an hour is needed for this book. <laughs> Zubair, can you just introduce quickly uh, next month's book? And uh, yep. that'll be the end of tonight's show. This one's orange. Uh, it's not red. It's The book is called, oh, you've got, you've got the name there. It's called Doctors or the Lives uh, and Works of GPs by Jonathan Gaithon Hardy. It's historical, I would say now, because it was first published in 1984. Um, so it's very much pre Atul Gawande, but given how things have changed over these, I thought it'd be useful to actually go through this book because I think there was a lot there about how GPs would practice within this country uh, and, and what they learned. And I think there was a lot there with regards to um, what we can take for our own practice going forward. So I think it'll be a lot more relevant to me and you, Fahim, probably more than maybe Mehran, um, because it's book, mm -hmm by GPs for GPs about what GPs thought and felt. Still hope you'll read it, Mehran, though, even with that preamble. <laughs> 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 that you I will. It's, I think it's even pre Zubair Patel, isn't it? <laughs> it just, I was actually yeah. born after that time, but yeah. <laughs> so we've got yeah. the web link there if people want to actually join us. Obviously, we've just started mm -hmm. off today. Um, and it's, uh, if you do want to actually participate, then uh, you would be allowed to. We have a maximum of 10 people who could come in and join us. Uh, but that's the actual streaming link for next month. Uh, and if people can actually get hold of that copy and read it, my thanks to... Uh, my co-presenters Zubair and Mehran for uh, one hour of the cerebral knowledge and thank you guys for actually reading the book and your insights I learned a lot and it's it's good to get those insights from different people once in the book and I, I hope we continue and long live the book club uh, off the shelf mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you thank you